and <laughs> taught in school. On to 1962, Hood and Warren are on parade during our travels in Crete. Then the Pyrgos dig with uh, the foreman Andonis Zidianakis and Nikos Vaskalakis, who followed him as foreman. The two of them are sitting on the bench there. And here is Yorgos Vasilakis, one of Andonis's uncles, who dug with Evans and had danced with Venizelos. <laughs> When the long study sessions began, the help of Bronwy Hanke, Petros Petrakis, whose wife was once cook in this house, and David Smythe was essential. And events like Leo's christening was, were a good friend. <laughs> Here at Hagia Sophia Knossos is Britain's bright new hope in antiquarian book selling, <laughs> supported <laughs> by Jack Davis, uh, well, I'm sure you can all see, uh, and Leslie Fitton, now Keeper of Greek and Roman at the British Museum, and two Stellier, plus Kiki Lembesi and Kostis Lovaras. Kiki, here you are. Oh, sorry. There's Kiki, and there's Kostis Lovaras. Uh, uh, among the other archaeologists. Then came Moroni, Leo by now six, and helping prospect for sites with Maria and Martha Lemus. Here we are, uh, and those who have worked at Moroni will know this house, which was the Apotheke uh, for many years, uh, very well. And while prospecting, uh, it led to a half-day rescue dig since the southern water main of Cyprus was about to go through Burnes. And in this unusual excavation, I kept the notebook, and the Pickman in the green shirt is, oh, sorry, I've got this sorted. Uh, the Pickman in the green shirt is Vassos Karayorgis, <laughs> director of the Department of Antiquities. <laughs> when we started a year later, the pipe had moved 500 meters inland. And here are two of the teams of Moroni, together with Master Pickman Simeon Clonaris, who by then had been digging for 55 years. And pictures of Moroni and Myrtos to end the little show. <laughs> Friends and colleagues at all age apprenticeship are vital, and recognizing that we practice a down to earth discipline. We investigate the daily lives and occasional deaths of ancient people and try to create wide-ranging history from the material evidence we assemble while having to accept that so often we start from aporia. We just do not know. We do not have the song and dance or the stories they told. We may have occasional peeps into their religions, but hardly more. We do not know their languages. We see a tiny selection, mostly upper class, of their skeletons, and we barely know where the majority of people lived. If welcome to Socrates, such ignorance is something that colleagues nowadays seem often to pass by. Perhaps in unadmitted dismay at the inadequacy of our explanations, they compensate by long words for little events and can pile on introductory slabs of theory to turn an inductive bottom-up discipline, where any interpretation stands only until a better one appears, into subjective, top-down, all-in-my-own-term statements that may well confirm what they posited at the start, but tell us little about the ancients. <laughs> weasel words and weasel attitudes abound. In the secular tradition of the Enlightenment, religion is reduced to the safe PC word, ritual. No question of contaminating one's interpretation, heaven forbid. Yet the odds are that it was religion, and not just ritual. And if so, to dismiss it as ritual is much the same attitude as the West has shown in its totally inept and arrogant handling of, say, Islamic religious extremism, failing to see that, because it doesn't matter to us, 
it doesn't mean it doesn't matter to them, as true for prehistory as now. Or one enhances the importance of studying kitchen pottery by calling it utilitarian, a travesty to philosophy. And I wonder, do the scholars of utilitarian ceramics go into the kitchen and talk with their spouse about which utilitarian bowl or saucepan to use? I bet they don't. Why then burden the ancients with pompous pseudo-utilitarianism? And there's feasting, an exciting concept in the worlds of TV dinners, carry out and order in, where the family barely eats together. But in the Mediterranean of Ye Ya presiding at Sunday lunch, and the Glendy with meat consumed by the Kilo, so what? Feasting is as old as time, and I'm sure has always been diacritical. In medieval halls, it was a matter of being above or below the salt, and competitive. Think of 900 guests at a wedding feast on the school playground at Palacastro, or the weddings in Cyprus with tables down the whole village street. That's enough of being a grumpy old man. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of archaeology does not go. It remains a thrill to understand a little better, even if we're still far off, how the ancient Cypriots and Cretans lived and supported themselves, how they used their territories, how they viewed their neighbours, how, perhaps, they worshipped, and how they created the worlds we see of Enkemi and Pelepaphos, Knossos and Petras, and in the Heraclean and Nicosia museums. And to compare what we learn with the long histories and practices of both islands before and after the Bronze Age. If it's demanding to write clearly and modestly, allowing room for the readers to make the connections themselves and not bombarding them with seemingly profound observations that are but trite trivia, it remains exciting to try to do this especially through the eyes and experience of others in the field, but most of all through the eyes and experiences of many Cretans and Cypriots over many years, who welcome us to their islands, let us dig, and teach us their remarkable long-lived cultures that help so much to explain what we grapple with in prehistory. So my final two thank yous are to the people, the islanders of Crete and Cyprus, and to the authors, editors, and publishers of the book, Helia Sassiparistov. <laughs>